Hey, Max K from Flux here, and today I'm going to go through the presentation that you would have heard if you were at Wired Festival Brazil on the 3rd of December. So I'm basically just going to read the presentation verbatim as I did it there. There are a few, there's one audience interaction part, obviously. I'll just ask you to play along nicely at home. Um, but yeah, so let's jump into it. So I'd like to start off with something a little bit off topic, psychology. Now, I have no idea if this works, but it should be fun. The idea is that if I give you permission to be part of the talk, then you're going to get more out of it. So, to get started, I'd like everyone just to raise a hand, get it up there, not really doing much, just up, out there, that sort of thing. Cool. Now that you've all accepted the permission, let's think about democracy. Now, I'm going to ask a question and then get you to raise your hand at the end. If you think that the best democracy is one that really channels the will of the people, that takes their preferences and turns them into law, hands up. Now, for those of you at home, I'll just get you to think about this. Think if you're on this side of the camp. Okay, good. Now, if instead of that, you think good democracy shouldn't be about the will of the people, but that the best democracy should produce the best legislation, make the best decisions for society, even um, to, to help society be prosperous, even if the people disagree with those decisions, hands up. Um, now, at this point in the, in the talk I gave in Brazil, it was about a you know, 10 to 1 sort of ratio. Um, and, I, and I suspect that that'll be the case for most people. And what we find is that it's an unpopular view. This idea of not taking the will of the people that actually it's about prosperity is an unpopular view. But what I want, for those of you who thought the first option, who were on board with the idea of channeling the will of the people, I want you to have a think and to think, why would democracy bring us prosperity if it were never designed to bring us prosperity? Now, for most of you, to get the most out of this talk, you're going to need to forget pretty much everything you know about democracy. While you're all thinking about that, Hello and welcome, my name is Max K, and I'm the co-founder of a movement called Flux. We're an organization made up of political parties, not-for-profits, and even a fully-fledged startup. Our purpose is to replace our aging democratic systems with something truly marvelous. We want to give every person on this planet a real chance to help build a better world, a more prosperous world, a world where the evils of today are considered a distant memory. We're not concerned with how things ought to be, but rather we're concerned with how do we build a brighter future for humanity and how do we do that now? For Flux, to do this, we've had to invent a completely new form of democracy, something that we call issue-based direct democracy, um, but we'll learn a bit about that later on. Tonight, I want to give you all the basic understanding to start to see which systems might work and which will not. Now, there are two main books this talk is, is based on, and I encourage you to read both of them. The first is The Dictator's Handbook, a wonderful and deep explanation of politics, and it explains politics uh, from the harshest dictatorships to the most enviable democracies. I particularly recommend CGP Grey's excellent 20-minute summary, Rules for Rulers, which can be found on YouTube. The second book is The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. It is a breathtakingly profound, incredibly consistent, and life-changing book. It is without a doubt the most meaningful and significant book that I have ever read. These two sources are important because they are at the crux of the two main mistakes made by other new democracy movements. The first mistake is that other movements often disregard the role of power in politics. Power is not something that we can do away with because it exists everywhere, and we often without power we can change nothing. The second mistake is that new democracy movements disregard the role that knowledge plays in prosperity. And to them I would ask, is there value in a society which represents people but does not prosper? 
And I say no, because such a society is doomed from the outset. Our primary goal in life, collectively and individually, is not to die. And if we do not appreciate the role that the creation of new knowledge plays in our survival, then we will eventually succumb to some disaster. In this sense, physics is no different from politics, because threats to our way of life come from everywhere. So, let's begin the explanation of these problems with something easy, a monarchy. Let's imagine for a moment that you find yourself the new king or queen of the land. All the people should follow you and obey your every command, but that will not happen automatically. You might be the monarch, but no monarch can make all the roads, enforce all the laws, or mine all the resources. No person rules alone. The only solution then is to find key people to support you, and you'll likely find them waiting for you, and these will become your keys to power. At this point, having just taken power, you are at your most fragile, and if you are not a satisfactory ruler to those keys, then they will replace you just as they replaced your predecessor. You must secure their loyalty, and this must happen quickly, and thus you will learn the first rule for rulers. You need the key supporters on your side. Being the ruler, though, you have an advantage nobody else has, and that is that you control the treasure. The first step is to buy the loyalty of your keys, and then use your keys to raise the treasure, and thus ensure that you can continue to buy the loyalty of your keys. Thus, maintaining control of the treasure is rule number two. You might think that since you control the treasure, you can spend it on nice things like hospitals and schools, but never forget, you will always have competition willing to pay the keys more. You must keep the keys happy. This is a problem not just for you, but also your keys, because being in a position of power or being a key is a position of power, and so they have to deal with all the same problems as you, and they're forced to behave in the same manner. There is no escaping this cycle. The next thing to consider as a monarch is how many keys you have. If you have too many keys, the treasure is spread too thinly and the keys aren't happy. Keep the number of keys small and you'll enjoy a longer career. This is the third rule for rulers, minimize key supporters. This also gives us the recipe for every coup. Gives us the recipe for every coup. Promise keys more treasure, use their support to overthrow the ruler, eliminate the useless keys, and everyone wins besides the dead guys. However, even if you do this with the best intentions, you might quickly find that you are just as bad if not worse, than your predecessor. Maybe you say, I won't, won't, I won't take all the power for myself, but instead I will start a democracy, and that will be different, right? No. The same rules apply. Your keys become the swing voters and big influencers, and the treasure comes in the form of tax loopholes, or special legislation, or government contracts. You see, in a democracy, corruption is a tool. Though corporate money or public funding might not help, they are never the root cause. The real cause of corruption is authority at all, and without removing authority from democracy, we can never rid ourselves of corruption. You cannot have a representative democracy without it. It simply isn't possible. The reason democracies appear richer is because their societies are more productive this leads to specialization and more key supporters, which in turn leads to unstable dictatorships, and that leads to democracy, which then helps society be more productive. But remember, productivity comes first. Representative democracy is not an escape from power, but all too often becomes a complex system to ensure that power is held by the few. This was probably never the intent but the reality is that when you invent something, it doesn't matter what you intended it to do, it matters what it does. 
and representative democracies simply do not do what we intended them to. The democracy that we know is therefore not much different from the dictatorship that we fear. The main difference is that democracy can sustain more keys. But what happens when there are too many keys? What happens if society is too advanced? I suspect that we are reaching this threshold today. When there are too many keys and society becomes too specialized, there is too much tension for any one ruler to manage their keys. But they also can't get rid of any. When this happens, we can expect extreme dissatisfaction, a high rate of turnover, and general chaos. In Australia, we have had seven prime ministers in 10 years. The US is dividing to a degree few people could claim to remember. The EU is polarizing to the point of fracture and the rest of the world is following suit. We are reaching the limits of representative democracy, but it feels like there's nothing on the horizon and we're all starting to panic. While writing this talk, I realized that we could create an actual hypothesis out of this reasoning. That is, the political system that eventually dominates is the one able to support the most key supporters simultaneously. Now, I'm not sure if any academic has ever suggested this, but it's nice that we arrive at a testable hypothesis. Now, all of this said, the problems with democracy go deeper. Let me demonstrate with a simple example a direct democracy with just three people. We have moral Martha, pragmatic Peter, and yourself. As you can see, we, you have the casting vote on issue one. However, you know that you want issue two to pass because you proposed it. What's the best thing that you could do to get your legislation through? You could analyze issue one and make up your own mind, but then you cannot guarantee that issue two will pass. Or you could ask Martha and Peter to support you on issue two in exchange for you voting with them on issue one. Now Martha, being moral, says no, that is not how democracy ought to work. Peter, being pragmatic, says, okay, it's a win-win, right? Thus, the optimum strategy is for you to make a deal with Peter, just like politicians do all the time today. But wait, you and Peter realize that if you always vote together, you can each do whatever you want. And congratulations, you've just invented a political party. The problem here is that when all voters are forced to vote on all issues, the optimum strategy is to maximize the chance of your policies passing, and that means forming a party. It means becoming a part of the largest block that you can. It doesn't matter if you do this in direct democracy or liquid democracy or representative democracy. The optimum strategy is to form a two-party system, and it will always happen even if sometimes we call it a coalition. Whew. Okay, so now that we've done that, we need to have a look at the other side, pure philosophy of knowledge or epistemology. One of the reasons we're so bad at making good democracies is that we ask the wrong question. When most people think about democracy, they think about how things ought to be, and they end up answering a terrible, poisonous question. Who should rule? Every democracy you know asks this question. Representatives are just rulers by another name. And direct democracy demands that everyone is the ruler, equally mashed together. This question is actually another question in disguise. What is the authoritative source of good policy? Now, early science as a field stagnated for thousands of years. We did have small bursts at times, like Greece, India, and Egypt, but these were the exceptions, not the rule. But then, about 400 years ago, science took off, and it did so because it adopted a totally new attitude to ideas. Ideas were no longer judged by who proposed them, but on their merits as explanations. Before the Enlightenment, 
we used to ask questions like, what is the authoritative source of knowledge? But now we understand that there is no authoritative source of knowledge, and there never can be. The Enlightenment brought with it a profound anti-authoritarian tone, and it set the groundwork for the open criticism and discussion of ideas that has fueled science in recent centuries. Democracy has seen, has it seems, has not yet had its moment of enlightenment. Until flux, until issue-based direct democracy, nobody had invented a system of governance that did not involve authority. That error will soon be over. Because just like science in democracy, there is no authoritative source of good policy, and there never will be. You've probably noticed at this point that if there is no authority on knowledge, we must have some way of measuring ideas against each other. If we didn't, science couldn't progress. Now, of course, there are experiments, but they rely on precise conditions and are not easy when it comes to policy. Experiments can't be the only way, though. After all, we knew of general relativity for decades before experiments began to confirm it. So there must be a way. Let's imagine for the moment that I tell you this explanation about the seasons. The seasons are caused by Persephone, the Greek goddess of spring. She spends six months of every year in the underworld, autumn and winter, and spring and summer above. Now we know that this is wrong, but 2,000 years ago it made sense. What's more, this is a testable theory. If the Greeks had known about the southern hemisphere, they'd know that the seasons were out of phase, and it would have disproven the Persephone myth. In ancient Greece, if a traveller from Brazil had made it there and told them of these other continents where the seasons were different, they wouldn't have had trouble adapting their theory, though. Their next theory might have gone something like this. Ah, so Persephone actually takes a holiday each year for six months, where she travels to the southern hemisphere, makes it summer there, and winter in the north. This, again, is another testable and explanatory theory, but we all know it to be nonsense. There are certain explanations out there, like this one, that bear no resemblance to reality. In fact, their only connections to reality at all are the ones that we give them by their very proposition. For an explanation to be credible, there must be other reasons for it being correct. There must be other connections to reality that the explanation relies on. So let's look at the correct explanation of the seasons, that the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted. Now, there are many connections to reality here. We know that sunlight hitting a slanted surface heats it less than a flat surface, explaining the colder climate at the poles. We know that some areas of the poles get six months of daylight in places due to the tilt, that a spinning sphere in space maintains its axis of rotation. It explains why the sun is lower in the sky in winter and higher in summer, and so on. If any one of those were found to be false, we would know that the axial tilt theory was wrong. There is no way that we could possibly tweak this theory to make it correct. And this is the core of a good explanation, that it is hard to vary. You cannot change the details on a whim because to do so would break the explanation. In the case of a bad explanation, such as our Persephone myth, we could tweak it all we wanted and it would still be just as testable and just as explanatory and still just as wrong. Being hard to vary is always a property of good explanations. Now, when we consider policies, we should think of them as explanations because at their core, a policy is just an explanation plus a situation and some instructions on how to, how to change our behavior to solve a problem. If policies are explanations, then good policy must be hard to vary. However, in today's democracies, we don't select for hard to vary policy. We select for popular policy, 
or policy preferred by one group or another. So why would we expect that any of these policies should be any good? Now there is one last matter of epistemology that we need to cover. The principle of optimism. This isn't like blind optimism where we expect good things to happen for no reason. No, this is something deeply true about the universe. All of reality is governed by the laws of physics, and this means that even complex problems, such as an influx of refugees fleeing Syria, is, at some level, just a problem of moving atoms around. Some of those atoms are in the refugees, some of them are in the brains of our rulers, some of them are in buildings or camps, or maybe still in the ground. Because all problems are like this, there are only two possibilities. Either the laws of physics prevent us from solving the problem, or there is some way to transform these atoms into a solution. And if a solution exists, it is only a matter of knowing how to make that transformation. Now, this doesn't mean that it's easy, of course, but it is possible. You might think that this is somewhat self-evident, and indeed it is, but if we rearrange this, we end up with an incredibly significant result. That all evils are due to a lack of knowledge. And this is the principle of optimism. So, given this, why should the aim of our political system be anything other than creating the right knowledge? Okay. So now we are finally on to issue-based direct democracy, or IBDD. This is Flux's solution to all the problems that I've mentioned in this talk. Instead of encouraging people to form bigger groups, it encourages smaller groups. Instead of asking all voters to vote on everything, it encourages them to specialise in only those issues that affect them. Instead of producing stagnant democracies that only change every few years, it provides a vibrant democracy that can change daily. Instead of producing explanationless legislation, it produces legislation that is resistant to criticism and hard to vary. Now, even going through the basic ins and outs of IBDD would easily take 30 minutes on its own, so we're just going to try and give you the essence of it today, the kernel that makes it tick. At the heart of IBDD, is the introduction of opportunity cost between issues, because this leads to a special reorganization of power. Now, it is not an intuitive solution, but it is quite elegant. And so far, we only know of one way to fairly implement this idea, and that is by creating a closed economy. This turns out to be neat because we've taken something that used to be a political problem and turned it into an economic problem. And while policies or politics does not have a habit of prosperity, economics does. We can inherit properties such as specialization and trade, a key driving force in humanity's recent prosperity, as well as other helpful economic metrics like comparative advantage. The way that we implement this is by giving all voters a choice on every issue. Every voter receives one vote by default and also has a reserve of political capital, sort of like special money that you can only use for votes. They then need to make a choice. Do they keep their one vote, like direct democracy? Do they trade their votes away for more political capital? Or do they compete using their political capital to bid on the votes that other voters didn't want to keep? One way to think about this is that it's sort of like betting on which policies are the best. If you're right, your political capital goes further so you can add and change more laws. If you're wrong, someone else will compete with you provide better legislation, and your political capital will be burnt up instead of using it effectively. Now, please remember back to Moral Martha and Pragmatic Peter from before. Let's have another look at what happens under issue-based direct democracy. 
To set the scene, issue one is Peter's issue, and issue two is the one that you've put forward that benefits you and no one else. This time, you get to play the villain. Now, Martha is very concerned about your legislation as she sees it as harmful to everyone but you. She does recognize that Peter's isn't the best, but the harm that it could do is minimal. Let's think about her strategy and yours. No longer caring about the first issue, both you and Martha give up your votes. Now, you can't make a deal with Peter anymore because he's going to get more than 50% of the votes anyway for issue one, which is all that he cares about. A worthwhile side note here is that since Martha is giving up her vote, Peter is pretty much guaranteed, unless you compete with him, to get at least 66%, and so there's no way that you can make a deal with him anymore because he's already got a majority. This means that you and Martha both bid on Peter's single vote for issue two, and since you have equal political capital, you split it 50-50. Now we have a situation like this. Martha has effectively prevented you passing your legislation. For her, this is a win because she would have spent her political capital to remove your legislation anyway. But for you, it's a loss because political capital you could have otherwise used to be productive is gone. Under IBDD, if you would end up burning political capital, the best move is to never put forward bad legislation in the first place. This is one of the core reasons that issue-based direct democracy can bring us into a new era of political prosperity. Now, there are many other things that IBDD does too. It incentivizes people who put forward legislation to ensure that it's already resistant to criticism before we ever vote on it. It encourages people to move from more popular issues to less popular issues. It makes it easy for small incremental changes to be passed and encourages people to take on pet political projects. It puts warring ideologies in a position where they can either burn political capital or work on new novel solutions that help that works for both groups. It's worth remembering here that the principle of optimism guarantees that there is a solution out there because no evil is a law of physics. It also ensures that ideologies who want to change everything water down their own political potential and thus change nothing. It scales to hundreds of billions of voters and the list goes on. So this brings us to the end, but before I close up, I'd like to mention that we're forming a Brazilian chapter. So if you'd like to be part of Flux, even as just a member, please head over to voteflux.com.br. You can find more about the Australian chapter at voteflux.org, and we can be contacted at leadership at voteflux.org. I want you all to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this video today. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. Of course, none of this would have happened without Wired, so I'd like them to thank them for flying me to Brazil also. Now, if I have done my job, I've given you all a bit of hope in these times that our political future can be as bright as the mind of any inventor or the canvas of any painter. Humanity has an amazing, inspiring, and wonderful future ahead, and I am so glad to be on this journey with you. Thank you. So that's it. That was the talk. Um, I hope that it helps you understand issue-based direct democracy. Um, it's definitely always fun giving it. And so, yeah, just like to say thanks. Cheers.